Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where I think we all know that Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon and that if you want to do something never before even thought of, you call it a moonshot. But today we're going to put those together and talk about why it was such a crazy moonshot to land Apollo 11 on the moon. And we've got the perfect teacher and venue here for you. We've got Greg Brown live at Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Neil Armstrong's hometown of Wapakoneta, Ohio. He's going to talk to us all about the Apollo 11 mission, how we prepped for it, how it happened, things that might have gone wrong. And now uh, we're saved by some heroism from Neil, Buzz and Michael. And, uh, and then we'll make sure we have some time for your questions. So couple things for you. One, we're going to keep it really interactive. Greg's going to ask you guys a lot of questions. So make sure you're ready to use the poll and the chat feature to the right of the screen. Um, two, make sure you're asking questions. In the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Greg uh, with all of your questions or as many as I can get to. He is an expert, so don't hold back on, on any questions. It's amazing talking to him about all things Apollo and space program. So throughout the class, if you've got questions, ask them. When Greg asks you guys questions, answer them. And make sure you've got a camera nearby because in about 45 minutes, we're going to give everyone a chance to take a selfie with the crew of Apollo 11. And if you upload that to Instagram, tag the Armstrong Museum and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a free month of VT+. So we'll tell you more about that toward the end. But with all that said, I want to introduce you to your teacher for today and one of my favorite teachers. I absolutely love these classes, Greg Brown at Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Ohio. Well, thank you, all of you viewers, for joining us tonight, and we're going to have a, a lot of fun, at least I, I will, hopefully you will too, in uh, talking about Apollo 11. So I'm really thrilled to be here. This is always fun for me, and uh, we're going to go through and talk about this historic mission, Apollo 11. So this screen here, we see uh, the famous boot print, and uh, many people think this is Neil's boot print. It's actually Buzz Aldrin's boot print, print on the moon. But nonetheless, we've got three separate things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the crew. Of course, we have to talk about them, the human interest side. We're going to talk about some of the operational details of the first lunar landing mission, very historic. And then I'm going to have some questions for you, the viewers. So the commander of this mission was Neil Alden Armstrong, born in our little town here of Wapakoneta, Ohio, in August of 1930. And he was more interested in flying than he was driving a car. Uh, he actually got his pilot's license at age 16 uh, before he graduated high school and before he got his little driver's license. He did attend Purdue University on a Navy scholarship and earned his bachelor's in aeronautical engineering. Um, and he also was a naval aviator during the Korean War, and he was a NASA test pilot, all of this before becoming an astronaut in September of 1962. At the time of Apollo 11, he was married to his wife, Janet. Uh, they had two sons, Rick and Mark. And prior to 11, prior to Apollo 11, Armstrong had commanded uh, Gemini 8, that mission, with David Scott in March of 1966, and that mission had included the very first docking exercise. So he was experienced uh, in spaceflight before he flew to the moon. And then we have the command module pilot uh, of this mission, and Michael Collins is going to be staying in the command module a command service module as it orbits the moon while the other two are on the surface. But Mike Collins was born in Rome, Italy. His dad was an Air Force officer. Born in October of 1930, he graduated from St. Albans School in Washington. He then attended West Point and graduated from that prestigious uh, uh, military academy. Uh, he served in the Air Force as a fighter pilot and a test pilot. And then he was selected in 1963 uh, by NASA as an astronaut. And at the time of Apollo 11, he was married to Pat Finnegan, and they had two daughters and one son. And previously, Mike had served on the crew of Gemini 10 with John Young. So he was an experienced pilot. And then the lunar module pilot, Edwin Eugene Aldrin, who went by the name of Buzz, uh, and he was born in Glen Ridge, New Jersey, although the very next town over, those two towns were next to each other, was Montclair, uh, New Jersey. And he grew up in that town, graduated from that high school. And then he attended uh, West Point as well, graduated, and then served in the United States Air Force as a fighter pilot. 
shot down a couple of MiGs uh, in the Korean War, and then he was an Air Force test pilot. He earned his doctorate from MIT there in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and then was selected as an astronaut in 1963, along with Michael Collins. He also was married, and he was married to Joan Archer, the previous Archer, and had two sons and a daughter, and he previously uh, flew with Jim Lovell on Gemini 12. So all three of these guys were space veterans of Project Gemini. Now we see a, a picture of Michael in the command uh, module there. So in the months before the scheduled July liftoff in 1969 of this mission, the crew was kept very, very busy uh, simulating uh, the mission, simulating parts of the missions, abort uh, phases and uh, you know return and reentry and, and uh, lunar activities. So they're very, very busy spending a lot of time at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. But in addition to that, Armstrong and Aldrin had to travel out west and they had to familiarize themselves with the various aspects of geological uh, discovery of investigation, trying to look at the rocks they might see on the moon, similar rocks, and know which ones they might want to collect. So we'll see a, a slide next of Neil and Buzz. And these guys are out there in West Texas near the Quitman Mountains. And as you can see, they're looking closely at some of those rock samples. Here's a shot of Neil in the, uh, in the sandy soil there. They're trying to simulate uh, moon soil, regolith. And he's at the Manned Spacecraft Center there and he's practicing at this very moment, he's practicing collecting the contingency sample, which would be the first sample of moon soil and rock that he would collect once he steps off the spacecraft. And Buzz Aldrin is also at the Manned Spacecraft Center. He's also uh, rehearsing his role in setting up various experiments. And here he's shown simulating the solar wind composition experiment and how he would set that up. So the objectives of this mission, and this is the G mission. Now, when we say G, the, the, the letter G, we're talking about the various missions that were planned and the missions were planned uh, starting with A, the A missions, and going on through J. Uh, so the G mission, Apollo 11, was uh, the first landing demonstration. Now, we've got a couple of different objectives that we're looking at here. So the primary spacecraft objective of this mission, and if I could tap my feet and you could hear that, or, or beat on the desk, um, I would do that. So th that means you need to pay attention. So the primary objective was to perform a manned lunar landing and return to Earth alive. That's, that's the objective. Okay, that's the primary. Now, the secondary objectives, there were several. We wanted to perform inspection and sampling of the lunar surface. We wanted to collect a contingency sample, a bulk sample or samples, um, also documented samples, if we can do that. We wanted to describe the lunar surface characteristics, and this would be over the radio and on the TV through the TV camera for the folks back home. And we also want to tell the folks back in Houston uh, what visibility was like there on the surface, going from sun into shadow and so forth. We also want to get data to assess the capability and limitation of the astronaut and his equipment in the environment of the lunar surface. And so try out the suits and see how mobile they are, that sort of thing. So the lunar surface extravehicular operations with the EMU. Now, that's not the bird. OK, that's the extravehicular mobility unit. And that is actually the formal name for the full space suit with the backpack and all that. We also wanted to describe the effects that the landing had on the lunar module itself. Maybe rocks were kicked up and pinged off the spacecraft. Maybe the thrusters, you know, kind of damaged the, the out, outside of the vehicle. We're just looking at those sorts of things. And then finally, the folks on the ground wanted these guys to be able to tell them the exact location in coordinates of the module itself. And it turns out that that was a little harder to do for these guys. So here's your first question. Hopefully you've been paying attention. So what was the most important goal or objective of Apollo 11? Here are your selections. 
were they intent on planting the U.S. flag on the moon? Was that the most important? That's A. What about B? We wanted to collect more moon rocks than the Soviet Union. Well, I mean, we're in competition with them, so maybe that's not a bad idea. How about C? We're trying to spy on the alien base found on the moon. Think about that one. And then how about D? Landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. So, <coughs> excuse me. So make your selections. Okay. Put your thinking caps on there. I see that there's some of you that are already on top of it. You're paying attention. Okay. That's very good. You, you're wide awake. All right. No matter where you are. Okay. So most of you have gotten this quite easily. And that answer would be D. Landing a man on the moon and bringing them back alive. That's really, really important for our program. So well done. Now we want to talk about the hardware of this mission, and that means the rocket or booster and the spacecraft. Now, in order to reach the moon, there has to be an upgrade, if you will, in our capability, because prior to this, we were working with fairly you know, small level uh, space flights in, in Project Mercury. We were going in orbit around the Earth. Uh, in Gemini, we had to learn how to go to the moon, but we didn't need these massive rockets. Well, now we're going to send people and spacecraft to the moon a long, long distance away, and we're going to need bigger and more powerful rockets. So uh, we had the Saturn V rocket. That was the biggest uh, rocket, most powerful that had ever been flown. And the Apollo spacecraft, we have a command and service module and we have a lunar module. Now, don't worry if you're not sure what they look like. We're going to show you what those look like. The booster or the rocket was 363 feet tall and weighed 6 million pounds when it was ready to, to rock and roll. A lot of fuel there. So the first stage was built by Boeing, the airplane manufacturer. They had five big engines producing over 7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. And this is a pretty big number. That's a lot of thrust. Now, here's a picture on the left of the first stage of the Saturn V. There were three stages. And if you can see the people down there next to it, this is lying on a trailer. And this is a monster, okay? Those big five engines you see there that are kind of covered with covers there. Well, look to the right. And the right side picture is of one of those engines with people in front. So you can see how massive just one of those F1 engines was. Nine, about 19 feet tall and weighed about nine tons empty. Talk about a whopper of an engine. The second stage of that rocket was built by North American Rockwell, and it was powered by five engines also, but these are a lot smaller. They are J2 engines, and they don't burn kerosene and oxygen like the other F1s do. These burn hydrogen and oxygen, and these five engines produced over one million pounds of thrust, so there you have that man there uh, at a scale. And then the S-4B stage built by McDonnell Douglas. Now, you might be wondering, uh, what? why would it be called the S-4B stage if it's the third stage? Well, we don't have time to go into that right now. But after, if you want to ask me, uh, we can talk a little bit about that. But this stage only had one of those J-2 engines. And each of those engines produced about 230,000 pounds of thrust. Now we come to the command and service module, and we're looking at a picture of actually Apollo 15's spacecraft. But unfortunately, I didn't really have any good pictures of Apollo 11's spacecraft like this one. So we're just going to use this one because it looked very similar. But this particular spacecraft was built by North American Rockwell also. It's about 33 feet long and a, almost 13 feet in diameter. And uh, we're going to show you some models of both this and the lunar module. So that hopefully will give you a little bit better idea of what's going on. So this is the diagram, the drawing of the Columbia, the spacecraft. And this is where the astronauts are going to stay the great majority of the time that they're in flight toward the moon and on the way back. And this is the part of the spacecraft that's going to splash down in the Pacific Ocean at the end of their mission. <clears throat> but I have a couple of models here. So the first model I'm going to show you is of that command and service module. So here we see a very nice 1 in 48 scale model of the command service module. So if you take a look here, 
you'll see this is the steerable S-band high gain antenna array that was used to send information back to Earth. And they could talk to the Earth this way. These gold little clusters here are quads and they are thrusters, little rocket engines to allow the spacecraft to rotate about its axis and move around a little bit. And then uh, let's see, there's the main hatch, the side hatch or the unified crew hatch there and get in and out. This device here is the docking probe that would actually connect to the docking tunnel of the lunar module when they dock. And back here, we can't forget this big rocket engine back here of about 20,500 pounds. This engine is going to slow them down and put them in lunar orbit. And it's also going to break them out of lunar orbit and allow them to come back to Earth when they're done. Okay. And then I've got a model of the lunar module. And this vehicle here is going to allow them to land on the moon. And so it's actually two stages. This bottom part is how they land on the moon, the rocket engine down here. <clears throat> but the upper stage actually comes off. If I can pull that off of there. And this will actually return to lunar orbit and dock with the command and service module when they are done. And so it's two parts. They have two separate propulsion systems, two separate propellant tank systems. So they leave the bottom part on the moon. And so there are six of those sitting on the moon uh, today. So here's our second question. And I just talked about this. So maybe you'll, this will be fresh in your mind. So who built the Apollo Saturn V rocket and spacecraft? Was it A, NASA? Did NASA do it? A lot of people who work for NASA, a lot of talented people. Was it B, Congress? Okay. How about number C, letter C, my Uncle Mort in his pole barn. Now, my Uncle Mort is a pretty talented guy uh, with a wrench. So, you know, maybe he did that. Um, pretty talented guy. Or is it D, a large group of private American companies, including Boeing, Douglas, North American, Grumman, and many other suppliers and vendors? So make your choices, A, B, C, or D. Hopefully you haven't been thrown off uh, by any of those questions. And yep, yep, looks like there's a lot of people that are definitely on top of it still. You, you haven't been uh, distracted too much by my shenanigans. So. Uh, Yep, that, that's, that's right. Um, almost everybody got this. And that is uh, number or letter D, a large group of private companies. So NASA does not actually build spacecraft and Congress certainly doesn't. Uh, and my Uncle Mort, uh, he's not quite that talented. Sorry, Uncle Mort. Okay, so on the left, we see the Saturn V on top of the mobile launch platform and that whole thing there is sitting on top of the crawler transporter. And this is actually a picture of Apollo 11's rocket, uh, AS-506, moving to the pad. But on the right, we see a picture of the crawler transporter itself. Now, if you look at those little people down there, they look almost like bugs, like little ants or something. Uh, this crawler transporter, actually there are two of them. They were built in Marion, Ohio by the Marion Power Shovel Company. And this thing has a de top deck that it is as big as a major league baseball infield. It is huge. And it weighs about 6 million pounds. So that thing had to pick up the rocket and the mobile launch platform and take it the three and a half to four miles to the launch facility or the complex where it's going to launch. Well, the big day has finally arrived. Everybody's anxiously waiting, and the crew also, very anxiously awaiting the, the day of their liftoff. So early in the morning on Wednesday, July 16th of 1969, and we see Armstrong there carrying his uh, air conditioning unit there. And you see behind him, there's another astronaut, that's Mike Collins, and there's a technician behind him. I can't tell you where Buzz Aldrin is at this moment in the picture. He might be peeking I don't see him peeking around the corner, but he's probably around the corner, okay? But they're headed for the white room on swing arm number nine. This is the top swing arm on that complex at launch complex 39A. 
So finally, the moment arrives at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on the 16th of July. We have a launch. We have a liftoff of Apollo 11. And that's an actual picture of that mighty Saturn V lifting off with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Between 750,000 and 1 million people are gathered at the Cape to watch this historic event. That's a whole lot of people uh, watching something happen. Uh, they were obviously very, very impressed with the historical aspect and wanted to be a part of it. Now, this is a shot of staging of the Saturn V. So uh, the first stage burns for about two and three quarter minutes, and then it separates and it falls off and actually falls in the ocean. So you're seeing that first stage has already separated. The second stage will then burn for about six minutes. Then it will shut down and then it will fall off and fall in the ocean. And then the third stage will burn for about two and three quarter minutes. So it takes about 12 minutes for the Saturn V to put a spacecraft in low Earth orbit. Now, during this ascent, the maximum amount of Gs that these guys experienced was about four, about four Gs or four times the natural uh, gravitational um, force that they we're feeling on Earth's surface, which is not all that much for a pilot. For me, that'd be a lot, but actually for pilots, it's not very much. So the flight is going to start really to the moon is going to start at what's called translunar injection, TLI. Now, this means that you're taking the spacecraft and that top stage of the booster, that third stage, you're going to orbit the Earth about one and a half times. When you get around the Earth to what's called perigee, basically of your of your uh, orbital path, you're going to fire that engine one more time. And it's going to be about a five and a half minute burn. Because here's what we have to do. To go to the moon, we have to speed up. 17,000 miles an hour in Earth in lunar, sorry, in Earth orbit, excuse me, in Earth orbit is not going to be nearly fast enough to get to the moon. So we need to speed this spacecraft up from 17,000 miles an hour to over 24,000 miles an hour. And this is because as we travel toward the moon, we're going to be slowing down and slowing down due to Earth's gravity. So when we leave the Earth, we have to have enough momentum to coast to the moon. So during the translunar coast period, when we're, we're already slowing down, we're going to do something called transposition docking and extraction. Now, that's a fancy name. You don't need to remember that. What that means is the spacecraft as you see on the left side, is going to pull away from the rocket booster and it's going to turn all the way around 180 degrees. It's going to go back and it's going to dock with the lunar module. And that is how they're going to fly together to the moon. It takes three days. Now, on the right, we see a computer generated image of the command and service module docked to the lunar module. And this is how they looked, with the exception of the legs, which were not extended like that until they reached the moon. But it's all in all a beautiful uh, image there of the two spacecraft. Now, in order to control the spacecraft on the way to the moon and back and around the, the moon in orbit, we need to interface to the computer, the digital computer. We need to talk to it. And since we're humans, well, we have to use some kind of keyboard okay, to do that. So this is called the DISCI, the Display and Keyboard, and it is the interface for the digital computer, the Apollo Guidance computer, used by the astronauts to enter commands into that computer. And this is on display in our museum. Now, you notice the keyboard is not a QWERTY board like we have on our computers. So in Apollo and in this type of computer system, they used verbs and nouns, which is kind of puzzling because they were both sets of numbers. Okay, but if you wanted to tell the computer to do something, you had to enter uh, this, this series of, of verbs and nouns. It took seven keystrokes. Two, you had to hit put a verb, two digits, and then noun, two more digits, and then you had, had to hit enter. And that allowed the computer to execute your command. Okay, so this is how they did that. Well, we see a gorgeous picture of our planet Earth, our home, and uh, from 11,500 miles 
away as they were leaving Earth. They turned around, they were able to rotate the spacecraft window so they could take this picture. And I got to tell you, this is a magnificent shot of our Earth, is it not? Wonderful, wonderful picture. Now, we did have color TV aboard the spacecraft as we're flying, and this is a still from that TV footage, that TV coverage there, as Buzz Aldrin is in the lunar module, and he's doing a checkout. Before they got to the moon, they went in and they did a kind of a checkout of the systems, make sure everything's working. Uh, they didn't want to be surprised when they got to the moon and find out something wasn't, wasn't right. So he's doing this broadcast, and at this point, they are 200 over 200,000 miles from Earth. So they only have about 36,000 miles to go. So they're most of the way there. Now we have a shot of the moon from that same distance, 11,500 miles. Now, of course, the moon is a lot smaller than Earth. So they've actually enlarged this photo because they're not the same size you know, from that same distance. But uh, we have a couple of facts about the moon. As you already know, the moon is quite a bit smaller than Earth. The diameter is only 2,000 miles. Surface gravity, one-sixth of Earth, or about 17% of Earth. Surface temps get really hot and really cold. During the lunar midday, it gets up to about positive 250 or so. And uh, during the lunar night, it gets down to minus 280. Uh, the lunar day and night are quite a bit different from ours. So even though one lunar day is one Earth month, 14 days of that are daytime and 14 days of that are nighttime. So it's a little different. Uh, if you're in orbit around the moon, now to say at there's an average velocity, that's kind of difficult to say, depends on how far you are from the moon. But basically, if you're in orbit where they were, you're moving about six tenths of one mile per second. But escape velocity from the moon, to get away from the moon and come back to Earth, it's one and a half miles per second. That doesn't sound like it's very fast compared to Earth uh, escape velocity, but that's still much faster than any bullet that we've ever seen, okay? It's really pretty fast. This is a beautiful shot of the backside or far side of the moon. Notice I did not say dark side. There is no dark side. This, this backside here gets the same amount of light as the front side. So on Saturday, July 19th, the spacecraft performed what we call LOI or lunar orbit insertion. That's a rocket engine burn and it's a short burn, um, but it was done at about 1.26 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on that Saturday. And we're looking at the crater Daedalus, which is again on the lunar far side. Wow, that's a really pockmarked surface, isn't it? So here I wanted to show you where on the moon they landed. Uh, you, if you're a sharp-eyed person, you'll see these little black arrows pointing with a little designation for which mission landed where. But honestly, those little black arrows are pretty tiny. So I added a red star there. So just below that red star, right about on the equator is where Apollo 11 is supposed to land. Is Apollo landing site number two. And it's in the southwest sector of Mare Tranquilitatis, or in English, the Sea of Tranquility. This shot was taken by Mike Collins out the window of the command module, uh, Columbia. That's what they named it. And so this is a, a kind of a neat shot of LEM number five uh, containing Buzz and Neil. Now, Mikey is not just taking pictures because he's bored. Okay, you might, you might think maybe he's just, you know, happened to take a picture of it. No, it's his job during this phase of the mission to do a very thorough visual investigation of the outside of the spacecraft looking for damage, also making sure that those legs are fully extended and locked before those gentlemen try to land on the moon. You notice those little spindly wire-like things coming down from three of those landing pads, foot pads, those are probes, and those will touch the surface first, and they will tell them uh, that they've made contact. So July 20th of 1969, this was a Sunday, the command service module and LEM undocked, and they performed a separation burn, and this then was 1.42 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Now, in order to control the spacecraft, you not only have to have the computer, but you also have to have 
manual controls. So I've, I've uh, included these two major controls. So the attitude controller or the ACA is the white joystick on the right. And that is for Neil's right hand. The thrust and translation control assembly or the TTCA is on the left. And that little T handle with that boot there, that is for his left hand. That allows him to control the throttling of the engine and also translation or straight line motion of the spacecraft. So we're going to see another diagram, which will kind of right here, which will talk about those two different types of control in case you're not familiar with these. So attitude control on the left is rotation about the three axes of motion. And that would be the vertical axis would be yaw. Uh, the, the horizontal green one would be pitch, and the kind of reddish one down toward the left is roll. So if your spacecraft is mo moving around those axes, it is pitching, yawing, or rolling, and that is called attitude and attitude control. On the other side, we have just these three arrows, and so if you are moving in a straight line in any of those axes, you are translating. No, it's not having to do with languages. Translation in spaceflight means straight line motion without rotation. Here we see an image, and this is a painting because nobody was outside the spacecraft uh, close enough to take this picture. But this is the descent orbit insertion or initiation. And this is the firing of the engine down there for about 30 seconds. And this deviates them from their initial circular orbit, and it creates a kind of a half of an elliptical orbit that will be used to take them down close to the surface. And they burned this engine at 3.12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You notice that that exhaust from that engine is pretty prominent, pretty uh, bright. In actuality, uh, really hard to see that uh, exhaust because of the types of propellants that were used. It was almost clear or almost transparent. Now, if you look at this diagram here, you'll see the spot in that orbit that has a red arrow. That is where they just did that DOI. Remember, this is going to deviate them. It's going to slow them down enough. They're going to be able to kind of gradually slide themselves down toward the surface in sort of a semi, sort of a half an ellipse. So they descend down there, and as they do that, they're just gliding, okay? But once they get down to a point about, oh, 47,000 feet or so, about nine, nine and a half miles from the surface, down here at the bottom, this is what's where they're going to initiate powered descent. There's that second arrow. So here is where they go through the three phases of the landing. And uh, they actually perform what's called the braking phase, the approach phase, and then the terminal descent phase. Those three phases are going to happen in about a 12 and a half minute period of time. It's not the same as the burn that we're talking about up there where we deviate from the orbit. We're actually going to burn our engine solid. It's on for 12 and a half minutes, and it's going to take us down to our landing. So what happens? Well, everybody knows, or most people know, there were some challenges and some issues with this uh, mission and the, try, the attempt to land on the moon. So five minutes after they lit that engine for powered descent, we have the first of five program alarms. And the computer is telling these guys it's overloaded, but they don't understand because they don't understand the code. So the first one, as you see in the picture there, is a 1202 alarm. The second one is a 1202 alarm. The third one is a 1201 alarm. And that's that's similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's it's similar. And then we have two more 1202 alarms. Now, as I said, the two men in this spacecraft, Neil and Buzz, are not familiar with this, these numbers. They do not know what these alarms mean. Thankfully, we had people at Mission Control in the back room that had a cheat sheet and that listed these alarms so they knew what they were. And they could tell these guys, yeah, you can ignore these alarms. We're go on those alarms. But what that, that did to them, though, is it distracted them. So th this was kind of a, a really a hairy part of the mission. Now, the guidance computer aboard the spacecraft was actually taking them into what they saw was a field of boulders. 
on the surface near West Crater. Now, when I say boulders, I don't mean rocks that you would put like in your garden or in, in, by your driveway. We're talking about boulders that are the size of cars. Okay. That's some serious rocks. Okay. So if you have driven a car, if you're an adult or if you're a child and you've ridden in a car, just imagine there are rocks that big. Okay. And they can't land there. There's just no way they can do that. So Armstrong has to take manual control of the vehicle and he has to translate or extend their range further down about a thousand feet, a little over a thousand feet to find somewhere he can put this thing down that's level. So that's kind of exciting. And by the way, they're getting a little bit low on fuel. Now, we finally have the probes touch the lunar surface at 4.17 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Remember, this is the 20th of July. So you might have thought that the first words spoken on the moon were, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Actually, no. The first words spoken were by Buzz Aldrin when he said contact light. There are two blue lamps or little lights in the spacecraft that go on when those probes touch the moon. And then they shut the engine down and they free fall that five and a half feet to the surface. But when they did, this view is what they had. This is looking out the window, totally alien landscape, very flat in this part of the moon, but they're on the moon. Tremendous. Now this view is the view that I saw when I was 11 years old, sitting on the floor with my parents of the living room watching this happen. And uh, I hate to say it, but I was complaining to my dad because it was a, not a very good picture. So I didn't really appreciate the gravity of the moment, no pun intended. But nonetheless, this is maybe a lousy picture, but this was Neil actually coming down the ladder caught by the TV camera that was uh, outside the spacecraft. So they just landed at 4.17 p.m., but get this, he didn't step out on the moon until 10.56 p.m. Imagine uh, how anxious and uh, uh, impatient I was as an 11-year-old kid waiting for that. But Neil puts his left foot on the lunar surface at that time, and that's when he says that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Just a tremendous, tremendous achievement, and uh, I have not gotten over that even to this day. So uh, we get asked this question a lot. And um, I thought I'd just kind of address this. So many people are really puzzled, or they think they know why Neil Armstrong was the one that stepped outside on the moon first. And honestly, uh, there's been a lot of, I don't want to say crazy explanations, but some of them sound pretty crazy. Neil Armstrong uh, was first to put his foot on the moon, but it was uh, more than just one or two things. It was actually a several factors that went into that. So NASA actually placed the astronauts in a rotation of assignments. So every three missions, you were supposed to rotate from backup crew to prime crew. And then three missions later, you would rotate back to a backup crew of a different mission. That wasn't always the way it happened. Sometimes they deviated from that a little bit for various reasons, but essentially that was the way it worked. Neil happened to be in the rotation as the commander for Apollo 11. So he's already on the crew. NASA management, however, could have, you know, removed him. They could have said, you know, we want somebody else. And that would have been that, but they wanted him on the mission. They were perfectly satisfied with him. As a matter of fact, NASA management was concerned about who they're going to set in this position because they know, just like you and I know today, this is the first historic landing of human beings on the moon. This is going to be a huge, huge event for time going forward. And whoever does this is going to be in the limelight for the rest of his life. So they wanted to pick someone that would be able to handle the fame and the notoriety and all this. Um, and not go crazy and you know, not make a spectacle, spectacle of themselves. So what they did was they said, uh, you know, Neil Armstrong has those qualities. He's like his idol, Charles Lindbergh. He's a very steady Eddie. He's a true blue straight arrow type of a guy. He's not a very moody guy. He's not up one day and down the next. 
He's not emotional. So we think that he would be an ideal guy to do this. And that was one factor. But it's also true that the LEM had flight controls based on which astronaut was on which side, the left or the right. And so each crewman had his own flight controls to watch and to use. So those were on each side. And then the confined space in that spacecraft really uh, made it more so of, a, of an easier decision because once those two guys are in there standing next to each other, and they're not sitting, by the way, they're standing so they could look out the windows. Once they're there, it's really better for them to stay relatively in those same areas. The, the crew compartment was only 36 inches front to back and 55 inches left to right, and they're wearing big bulky suits. Now, the last factor is Grumman, the spacecraft manufacturer, designed the hatch to open inwardly to the right. It just so happens the commander Armstrong is on the left, Buzz is on the right. When you open the hatch, he is trapped against the right bulkhead or the right wall. So this really was kind of the, the nail in the coffin, so to speak. This determined that they were going to have Neil get outside uh, first. So let's take a look at the next slide. We're going to look at a gentleman who's standing in a mock-up or a training version of the LEM. And you can see that it is not very big. It's really quite small. He's not even wearing a suit. Okay. So these guys are standing there next to each other, looking out of each window. And uh, down below, we'll see the hatch. There's the hatch. It had to be pretty wide so they could get through there with their backpack on. OK, so this is essentially these uh, issues are essentially why uh, Armstrong was first out. So here's the question. OK, so hopefully I didn't put you to sleep there talking about that. But why was Neil Armstrong the first to step onto the moon? Well, A, he wanted to be famous, so he fought his way past Buzz Aldrin and jumped out. I've actually heard this uh, from some people. B. He was a better rock climber than Buzz. Well, you know, that might be important. They are there to collect rocks after all, and it's kind of a rough uh, surface in places. What about C? A number of factors were involved in NASA's decision to have him exit the spacecraft first. Or D, Neil suffered from claustrophobia and he could, just had to get out. He could not stand being in there any longer. So those are your uh, options, your choices. So make those choices. Uh, okay. Yeah. Somebody got tripped up there. Uh, but most of you are, are, are right on target. And, uh, it looks like, uh, most of you have gotten that right answer, which is D. I, sorry, fooled you. It was C. So he actually was chosen due to a number of factors that we mentioned just a moment ago, which is easier to say, uh, to people, um, sometimes, Sometimes it's kind of hard to describe all that. So anyway, here we have a shot of Neil. Uh, this, I believe, is uh, the motion picture film while he's down there by himself. And we actually can sort of see his face in this enhanced photo. Uh, originally, the photo wasn't very good and it was hard to see his face. So there he's outside the spacecraft. He's on the surface and he's going uh, to start collecting samples and uh, taking pictures. Now, Buzz Aldrin came, comes down the ladder about 20 minutes later, and uh, Buzz's job is, for the most part, to deploy a set of experiments. So this shot uh, that Neil took of Buzz is showing Buzz removing some of those experiments from the spacecraft. This is a storage area kind of in the rear uh, of the spacecraft. So he's taking out the what's called the early Apollo surface experiments package, which included the passive seismic experiment which we'll see in a minute, and the laser ranging retro reflector, try saying that fast five times. Also the solar wind composition experiment. And if you see in the foreground, this thing that looks kind of like a, a vacuum cleaner or something, that's, a, that's actually a camera. That's the Apollo lunar surface close-up camera. And that is also left on the moon as well. Now, the EVA or the extravehicular activity, that is they, their activities outside the spacecraft, were only two and a half hours. 
That doesn't seem like a long time when you've taken all that time to get there and it takes all that time to get back to Earth. But this was the first landing. So we didn't really have a lot of, you know, exploration in mind. We were just going to do some limited things and get back alive. So on the left, we see Buzz standing next to that solar wind composition experiment. It's a foil sheet and that will be rolled back up when they leave and brought back to Earth for analysis. And then on the right, you see Buzz. He has just deployed the passive seismic experiment. And this was designed to pick up meteorite impacts and moon quakes. And in fact, it did pick up a lot of meteorite impacts uh, during the time that it functioned. Here are some tools that Armstrong and Aldrin used while they were on the surface. So the first one down on the left is a hammer. Okay, geological hammer. The second one is kind of uh, hard to for the viewer to see what it was or is, but it's actually called a gnomon, a G-N-O-M-O-N, and that is a sun shadow device, and it would the legs would fold out, and you could tell the scale of things that, that you were next to, and it would cast a shadow. Um, the, the third object is a set of tongs, and then the fourth thing is an extension handle that you could attach two other tools. And of course, the last one on top is a scoop that they would use to collect soil and rocks. Now, this is sort of a tricky thing because I didn't really explicitly say it, state it, but here's the question. Why did the crew need a hammer on the moon? Now, I said it this way because you probably can figure the answer without me having to explain it, but I give you these choices. So did they need a hammer to build a moon base? Did they need a hammer to open stubborn pickle jars? Now, this may seem funny to some people, but I got to tell you, I've had trouble opening these doggone things, and I know probably most of you have too. So maybe that's what it's for. How about C? You know, that hammer would be a pretty good paperweight. You know, it's aluminum. It's not super heavy, but it would be a nice paperweight. Or D, what do you think? To pound core tubes into the soil for collecting samples, maybe. So make your choices there. And uh, again, I, I apologize. I hope I haven't misled anybody too much. Uh, but it's pretty obvious, I think. I think it was safe to say that most of you will get this. And it looks like you are. Yep, most of you are getting this. Um, the answer is actually D, to pound core tubes into soil. Those hammers were very useful. Now, uh, Buzz was setting up the experiments most of the time. And Neil was collecting most of the samples of rocks and soil, not all, but most. So uh, 47 pounds of material were brought back on Apollo 11. And on the left, we see the micrograph, or, or it's actually a photograph of a slice of a moon rock that was sliced off in a thin slice. And then they took a picture through, the, through a microscope. It is sample 10017. And that sample when Neil brought it back was originally 34 ounces, but they chopped it up when they got it back into a bunch of smaller pieces. And the sample on the right is actually a sample that's in our museum on display and it weighs four ounces on earth. So much smaller, but it is an interesting rock because it's a basalt, it's a lava rock from the moon picked up by Neil Armstrong. So, aha. I surprised you. There's, there's a question here already. So the lunar sample I just talked about, this one right here, weighs four ounces here on Earth. Now, we're not going to set out to challenge you mathematically, really. This is not a math course. But we want to get you to think about this a little bit. So what would that rock weigh on the moon in one-sixth of Earth's gravity? So keep in mind, it weighs four ounces here, and the moon has one-sixth Earth's gravity. So the answers are 34 ounces. What about B, four ounces? Well, it weighs four ounces here on Earth. So think about this. Would it really weigh four ounces on the moon? How about C, 19 grams? Hmm. I've thrown you a curveball here. Okay. And the answer D is 0.67 of an ounce. Now, remember, if you're going to find out what something weighs on the moon, the simplest way to do it is divide by six. OK, just divide by six. OK, so make your selections. This might be a little trickier because you weren't expecting a math problem, but it's really not much of a math problem. It's pretty, pretty easy, really. But I have thrown you a curveball. OK, I have to admit that. So we'll just see how this turns out. 
some of you are going to be sharp and it, yep it looks yeah there's some people there that really watching that have really uh shown me that they are not only paying attention but they actually have a mathematical uh mindset they they very quickly got the answer so i'm going to uh go ahead and tell you that both c and d are correct okay so i did throw you a curveball 19 grams is the weight on the moon of this object okay in si units okay like say metric be it would be metric and d is 0.67 of an ounce that is what the english measurement system would say if you divided four ounces by six so if you've got c d or both you got it you got it right On the spacecraft, on the LEM, on the front leg, behind the ladder right there, as you see, was a plaque. And uh, this was kind of a neat touch. So we're going to go to the moon, and we're going to put a plaque on the spacecraft. And when we get there, we're going to take the cover off. It's like a stainless steel plaque and a stainless steel cover, I believe. And so this plaque reads, as you see on the right, here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 69 AD. Uh, that means Anno Domini, literally the, the year of the Lord, is what that means. That's the old way of saying what year it is. And here's the most important part. We came in peace for all mankind. And this was true. This was really our intent. Tremendous thought. So on the top left, we see a picture of Neil Armstrong with the World Scouting Badge, which he brought to the moon, the surface, and then brought back home. Now, I don't know where that particular badge uh, is now. So it might be with the Boy Scouts organization. It might be at Purdue. It might be with one of his sons. I just really don't know where that ended up, but pretty important. So Neil actually thought quite a bit of his time in the Boy Scouts, thought it was very valuable. At the bottom, we see a picture taken by Buzz as they got back into the spacecraft and you can see his face. Look at his eyes. I mean, yeah, he's very satisfied, but boy, they're just shot. They are so tired. They got up really early that morning. They've been up for who knows how long, and they're <laughs> really just just gassed. But they're really really satisfied. Monday, July twenty first. Now I do want to state that if you're watching from overseas, and you may be, um, we're not saying that uh, our time zone is the time zone. Okay. Because actually, when Neil stepped out on the moon, it was already the 21st to those of you in Europe, okay, and in various other parts of the world. But uh, we're using uh, Eastern Daylight Time and Eastern Standard Time here because this is where uh, the mission lifted off from, and this is where most of my viewers often are. Um, if you want to know what they what it was in Houston, where Mission Control was, well, it's, it's a little behind us, okay, so it's a little later, but... Uh, this is why I give you these times, okay? So you don't think that, you know, we're something special here, but I have to have a frame of reference. So on uh, Monday, July 21st, at 1.55 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the upper stage, remember, I showed you a picture of the lunar module. The upper stage lifts off from the moon's surface, leaving the bottom stage behind. They lift off. They rendezvous with the command service modules. They have to find that other spacecraft in orbit. And then they dock or connect to that spacecraft. And then they jettison or they get rid of that upper stage. They're no longer going to use it. And it's going to end up crashing into the moon. But all that was done between 1.55 p.m. and 7.41 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Now, rendezvous is a, a complex affair. And we had to uh, learn it and perfect it around earth during project gemini that's what gemini was all about a lot of it so we have to get the spacecraft which you see in the lower left corner of this image this has to find the other vehicle and it has to find it without a lot of difficulty it can't take a lot of time doing that because the lunar module ascent stage is very limited in its consumables fuel breathing air water battery power this stuff is in limited supply. And if you look at that thing, you can see there's no landing legs. There's, no, there's nothing. This thing cannot land anywhere. So they have to do a very good job and be quick about it and get into orbit and then find this other vehicle. So rendezvous was a very critical operation. 
Well, they did it successfully, obviously. And here we see a beautiful shot of this beautiful Earth over the horizon of the moon, that colorful Earth coming up over the horizon. As in the foreground, we see the eagle, the LEM, returning to the command service module. They have rendezvoused. They are approaching. And you might say, huh, that looks like those two guys are upside down. But ironically, if you were in their spacecraft looking at the command service module, you would say that the service mo or command service module is upside down. So in space flight, basically most of the time there's no up or down. Uh, it's all the same. Now they've docked, and of course, they're going to bring all their rock samples and the film and everything from the cameras back into the command module through the tunnel, and then they chuck the uh, LEM ascent stage off, and again, it, it uh, eventually crashed into the moon. But here we see a diagram of what's called TEI, trans-Earth injection, and this is uh, necessary to break out of lunar orbit and begin our return to Earth. So you notice that they, they separate the LEM, and then they spin around so they're facing you know forward and they're going to fire that big engine back there and the the and the uh burn lasted about three minutes this is again called the trans earth injection burn they have to speed up to about one and a half miles per second maybe a hair over that so they can break out of lunar orbit and this was on the 22nd of july on that tuesday and this was between 12 55 and 12 58 a.m so right after midnight on the 22nd of July. And so they have, are, they have, they did, <laughs> they uh, did spend three days, which were pretty uneventful. I don't want to say that they didn't do anything. You know, they weren't just lounging around, but they really weren't engaged in any kind of really critical operations. They could sort of relax a little bit, which was nice. But on the 24th of July at 12.22 p.m. Eastern, they separated the command module, which you see there, uh, from the service module. And this is because the service module is not going to come back and land on Earth. So they separate that. It's going to burn up in the atmosphere. And that will leave only the command module, the top part there, the cone, to re-enter the atmosphere and splash down in the ocean. So shortly after they separate, they are really picking up speed now. And so they make what's called entry interface. This may sound like kind of a fancy word, but this is where re-entry officially begins. It's about 400,000 feet or about 75 miles above the earth. Now, this picture is from the, the uh, film of them coming back to the atmosphere and this, the heat is tremendous. <clears throat> so the velocity of the spacecraft at this point is 36,000 feet per second or 6.85 miles per second. That's smoking fast. So the G's that they experience uh, deceleration is about six and a half. Now the reentry corridor or the pathway they had to hit to make it safely through the atmosphere was only two degrees wide. That's not very wide at that speed. Uh, their actual phi or flight path angle was about 6.5. That's minus 6.5. Um, and they're, so they're slightly at an angle coming in, but the heat shield had to handle 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's probably hotter than any of your chili has been. I know some people like really hot chili. I don't think any chili can come close to that. So they have a little bit of a, a radio communications blackout for several minutes. Uh, this is a normal part of reentry as the plasma, that hot gas uh, surrounds your spacecraft and prevents any messages from getting through. So that's a few minutes. But they finally splash down, as you see there, 1250 p.m. Eastern Daylight. Now, where they splashed down was Pacific, you know, in the Pacific. So it was a totally different time. But this is what it was when, here when they did that. And the spacecraft, usually in Apollo and Gemini, hit the water at about 31 feet per second, which is about 22 miles an hour. So they start out re-entry at, you know, 6.5 miles per second, and they hit the water at 22 miles an hour. So they were about 930 miles southwest of Hawaii when they splashed in the ocean. Now, they're going to be picked up by uh, forces from the USS Hornet, that Navy 
aircraft carrier. And this is uh, old reliable 66, they called it. Uh, it's an SH-3 helicopter. And so they're picking up the crew. But down there in the water, you see barely see some crew members. And then you, there's also some uh, Navy frogmen that are helping them. And they're going to take them to the deck of the Hornet. So once they're on the Hornet, they are inside this mobile quarantine facility. And this is a modified Airstream trailer. For those of us in Ohio, uh, it's another Ohio product. It was made at the Airstream plant just, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 miles from here or maybe a little less at the Airstream plant. So uh, that's kind of a cool thing. But uh, the astronauts there are kind of having a moment with their wives through the intercom. Uh, if you see the lady on the left with the white, they're wearing the white, that is Pat Collins. Uh, the lady wearing the blue is Jan Armstrong and the blonde wearing the orange is Joan Aldrin. And they're talking to their wives before they depart for Hawaii. So the ship actually went to Hawaii, and then they flew the mobile quarantine facility to Houston, and they placed them in the astronauts inside this big complex called the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, where they were going to spend the rest of their quarantine time. So on the left, we see Neil in the MQF, and he's plucking a ukulele. And uh, I, sp I spoke to Neil's youngest son, oh, about two years ago, and he said, yeah, dad had a couple of couple of ukuleles he like to pluck around on. So uh, he's doing that. And then over on the right, we see the crew going through the dining facility or chow hall, if you've been in the military. And uh, they, they had uh, like bedrooms and uh, a kind of a meeting room, sort of uh, like a living room section of that. All there inside and they were in quarantine in there for a total of 21 days. So here's the last question. And you can see a picture of Neil plucking the ukulele and Mike Collins is jokingly putting his uh, fingers in his ears. Now, I don't know what kind of ukulele player Neil was. I, he could have been pretty good. He was a decent musician in some respects. So he might have been OK. And maybe Mike was just playing around. So I don't know. But the question is, due to his ukulele playing, Neil was known by the nickname Tiny Tim and he recorded the song Tiptoe Through the Tulips when he returned from the moon. Now, this is, again, true or false. So think this through. Now, if you're my age or older, you're going to know the answer to this. If you're a younger person, you might not know the answer to this. So it might be a 50 or 50 shot, you know. So take your shot there. Yeah, some of you either guessed right or you know it's coming in here. And uh, a few of you weren't so sure. So um, the actual answer is, that is false. Uh, there was actually a musician named Tiny Tim, and he was a singer, and uh, he did record that song in, I think, 1968. Uh, interesting name, though. Tiny Tim was about 6'3", uh, not tiny, and uh, he had an unusual falsetto voice. So if you ever look that song up, uh, you will see why once you hear that song once, you may not want to hear it again. <laughs> interesting experience. Okay, so <clears throat> once these gentlemen got out of quarantine, they were allowed to, they actually went to uh, several major cities on tour, and then they were allowed to go to their own hometowns, uh, which Neil did on September 6th. He was in his hometown of Wapakoneta for a parade and spent some time with uh, the natives there uh, in his town. But this picture is from New York City. Uh, they were in a huge parade, as you can see. And the red arrow is there to help us identify Neil because his arm is in front of his face as he's waving. Next to him on the left is Buzz in the middle. And then on the far left, we see Mike uh, looking upward, probably at all that confetti being dumped down on them. So uh, just a tremendous, tremendous reception when they got back. And uh, what an accomplishment. So I want to restate these achievements in, in formal terms, because this is really important, I think, for everyone to remember. The United States fulfilled President Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth before the end of the decade or the end of the 60s. The second thing is the U.S. proved that its people could meet a highly technical, risky challenge and, uh, very importantly, meet it openly in front of the entire world. The Soviets... As brilliant as their people were, they were 
doing all of their achievements. They were doing all their missions in secret, and they didn't want anybody to know when they goofed up and when they had problems and, and accidents. So we were doing this in front of the whole world. And thirdly, the first lunar landing was accomplished not as a military conquest, but in peace, and it brought people from all nations together in celebration. That's very important to remember. So that's pretty much the conclusion of that uh, presentation. Hey, thank you very much. What an unbelievable journey. Thank you for uh, all the insight, all the details, all the humor. I think everybody's going to be getting on their uh, their music app and uh, looking up Tiny Tim right after I hope this. So. But, uh, you know, trying to find the Neil Armstrong co co cover version as well. So um, thanks to you, Greg, for uh, for some, some really, uh, you know, just amazing insight. And what an incredible story. Um, I love that. The reason, one of the reasons Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon was that's the way the door opened is, uh, is such an incredible answer to this <laughs> monumental question. So hopefully everyone yeah. learned some things that they enjoyed as well. And a uh, couple of reminders to everyone out there. One, please keep your questions coming in. And uh, two, we promised you guys an opportunity to take a picture with the uh, the crew of Apollo 11, you know, the, arguably the greatest achievement in, uh, in all of human history. So uh, I want to go full screen to that here in, in just a second. A reminder, if you upload that to Instagram, we'll have the official handles on the way out. If you do that and tag Varsity Tutors and the Armstrong Air and Space Museum, you'll be entered to win a free month of VT Plus with us. We'll tell you a little bit more about that with some links on the screen. But uh, right now, we want to take you guys full screen to uh, to get that picture. So hopefully you guys have your cameras out. And uh, while you're doing that, think of uh, any final questions. We'll have at least five minutes to do those. But for now, let's get those pictures. <clears throat> All right, hopefully people got pictures there. Uh, they're thrilled about uh, just a monumental crew to uh, to be able to get pictures with. And we've got time for a couple of questions. We're a little bit over time. But you can't do Apollo 11 in just a minute. So great. if you don't mind hanging out for a couple of questions. Um, one, you, you mentioned uh, partway through that, uh, that it was a little bit interesting that, uh, you know, one of the um, uh, modules there was an S4, but it really should have been the third phase, phase S4, uh, but should have been uh, labeled three. Of course, people were going to ask you about that. Um, can you give us that reason? Yeah, so it's actually a, a, a design engineering history issue. So when they first started planning this massive rocket, it was called the C5, and it had five stages. And that, that never happened, of course. So uh, it was called the Nova. So what the engineers did was they set up the design for first stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage, and so forth. Well, as they changed the des overall design, they realized that they were still going to use that stage, even though they were going to change things. And that stage, because they had already started letting contracts out and bids and so forth, I apparently they didn't want to change it after they got to a certain point, because now they've got the stuff down in writing and contracts are being signed. So they just kept the S4 designation, even though it ended up being the second stage of the Saturn One and the third stage of the Saturn V. That's basically the answer. Nice. So there's a lesson in there. Be careful what you name things because over time you might be stuck with them. So um, yeah. thank you for that. Um, another one people came up with, I think, I think a lot of people were surprised to know the, the first words um, spoken on the moon were contact light. I think we've all heard the eagle has landed, which I think Buzz Aldrin said pretty shortly after that. And uh, one small step for uh, man, one giant leap for mankind. Um, how did the other two become more, you know, so famous and, and we've sort of overlooked contact light? Um, and then a follow up, a couple of questions, if you don't mind, about first thing spoken on the moon. Some people wanted to know, was that spur of the moment for Neil? That it, was he thinking about that even before he left? Did, did someone, you know, was that scripted for him? What do we know about his most famous words? So his famous words, um, we've heard several versions or several explanations by other people, but actually from Neil himself, he said that because that he and the crew didn't really think they had better than a 50% chance of successfully landing. Now, they didn't mean they were going to get killed. 
They just meant they would have to abort. They probably thought they had a 50% chance of landing successfully or aborting. He said he didn't really give it much thought until they landed because, you know, why think about that if you may not even land? So he didn't expend any energy on it. So he said once they landed, they had some time to think about it. You know, think about it. He didn't get out and put his foot on the soil until 1056. They landed at 417. So they had some prep time and they ate. They didn't rest, but they had some prep time. He went over it in his mind. And at that point, he said, this is what I'm going to say. Um, even though there are people that believe that, you know, NASA was telling him what to say, that's not true. Uh, all those guys that landed on the moon, the commanders, they said they all used their own words. They came up with what they wanted to say and they said it. So Neil claims that that's what he thought of once they landed. That I did think that was really amazing too when you mentioned they, uh, they you know, kind of, for any of us who have ever been on a flight and thought we landed, why can't we get out yet? They were, uh, they were hanging out for a while there with good reason. So, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's neat that he had some time to think about what came next. Um, speaking of Neil Armstrong, I know you're, you're over time with us. So, uh, so thanks. No, that's for okay. That. I'm good. Um, maybe we'll, we'll kind of end here. You, uh, you're at Neil Armstrong's museum. Um, what, uh, what can you tell us about um, when should we visit? What should we look for? And we're there. Um, how can we get there to uh, Wapakoneta? Um, uh, would love to hear more. It's just so uh, so amazing that you know with, with such an achievement of Neil Armstrong to be talking to the folks directly at his museum. So uh, thanks for sharing all this with us. Tell us a little bit more about the museum and uh, and and you know not why should we come visit? Of course we should come visit, but uh, when and what to see once we're there. Okay, so we are open from Wednesday through Sunday, and I think uh, once we hit um, Memorial Day, or maybe it's April first. I just have to watch the website. We will be open. Uh, I think it's on Tuesdays as well. We're going to be open up another day, but we're open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. I think we're going to 5, 5 p.m. But again, check the website before you make any travel plans. Um, we are located very easily, uh, easily found. We're right off I-75, inter inter Interstate I-75 and 33. And those, you know, they kind of crisscross each other. So we are about, oh almost halfway between Toledo and Dayton. We're actually a little further south than that, but um, Interstate 75, exit one, uh, 111. That's where we are. We're not hard to find, and we're right next to the highway. So if you're down I-75 and you pass Wapak, you're going to see us, okay? We're right there. So it's easy to find. Uh, this summer is our 50th anniversary as a museum, so we've got some special things planned. We have the four frogmen, that recovered Apollo 11 coming back. They were here last year, they're coming back. We don't, I don't right now think we have any astronauts scheduled. We normally do, but we don't, I don't believe we have this year's yet. But we have those four frogmen and we are going to have the christening, I guess you would call it, uh, the announcement of our Learjet, which we now have, and it will be mounted next to our other aircraft that Neil flew out in front of our museum. So that's really gonna be cool. And uh, we have a lot of things inside that are either were flown um, by Neil Armstrong or that were taken into space and, and brought back and taken to the moon. So a lot of really interesting artifacts. The Gemini 8 spacecraft is our premier artifact that he flew in 1966. The airplane he learned to fly in, the Aranka Champ is inside also. And we have two of his suits, uh, a, an Apollo backup suit and a Gemini suit. So lot of and the moon rock so a lot of things to see even though we're not a really big museum we have a lot of really valuable things uh, and important things to see awesome well thanks for sharing so much of that with us here, if you get a chance, uh, if you're ever driving in between, you know, Detroit and Cincinnati, or you're not far from Indianapolis or Pittsburgh, there's ways to, uh, to be able to get there. But if not, if you don't have any plans to take you to uh, Central Ohio uh, this, this year or anytime soon, um, Greg and the team are going to be back a few more times throughout 2022. So um, they've got some celebrations to do there at the museum on the 50th anniversary of this year. There's plenty more opportunities to come back with our student tutors. There's also last year's classes. We did a great one. You mentioned the, the Gemini missions and uh, some heroics from 
from Neil Armstrong. That's available on our YouTube channel um, and more content with uh, with the Star Course series and BT Plus as well. Speaking of which, we'll, uh, we'll try to, we know at the school night, we'll try to get everybody out uh, to, to do some homework because now you're inspired. Um, here are those rules to uh, to be able to get that selfie um, up there to uh, to be able to, to take advantage of the contest there. And there's information uh, about VC plus there on the screen for you. So thanks a lot for everybody for all of your amazing questions and uh, participation and, uh, and all those kind of things. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing everybody back here soon. So thanks everybody.